Okay, thank you for the introduction and to invite me here and thank you for coming. So uh, yeah, we'll try to summarize the work I've been doing, uh, let's say 60% of the work I've been doing in the last three years about microstructure imaging with uh, both water MRI and diffusion of metabolites that we measure with spectroscopy. Uh, so the talk, I will just give a very brief introduction of what are my interests and then uh, I will uh, show you some results on uh, a new way of doing numerical simulations to help the design and the validation of uh, MRI techniques. Uh, and then some applications uh, with metabolite diffusion MRS to quantify cell-specific biomarker of uh, cell microstructure, also disease-specific biomarker, and then uh, uh, one of the recent application of this framework to image uh, cell body or soma non-invasively using MRI. So as introduction, uh, the target of my research is neurodegeneration and any kind of neurodegenerative diseases. And uh, so, uh, well, we all know that this is important because it's a major health and social issue. But the problem in this field is that there is a lack of quantitative biomarkers that can directly reflect the neuronal status. So, for instance, uh, in Alzheimer's disease, you can have accumulation of uh, uh, proteins inside and outside the cells. So, an imaging, uh, uh, a direct imaging biomarker would be a biomarker of the density of these proteins. And we know PET is widely use, used for this, but we would like to use uh, more non-invasive non non-invasive technique that don't use radioactive substances like MRI. Another example is uh, always in Alzheimer, you may have a different behavior for different cell types. So neurons undergo atrophy while other cell population like glia, in particular astrocytes, uh, undergo reactivity trying uh, to preserve neurons from the death. So these two population change their morphology and their structure in a very different way. And in, in uh, multiple sclerosis, for instance, you have demelination. So different aspects of the brain undergo different microstructural changes according to different disease. And the problem is that uh, to access these differences in the disease and in the microstructure, we should go in this region a sub-micrometer or micrometer region, while the resolution of the non-invasive techniques like ultrasound and MRI, it's around millimeters, if you want to look at the, the clinical uh, MRI. Preclinical, you may go down uh, up to here, but still uh, is not enough to actually directly image any single aspects of the morphology. And this would be basically extremely important because if we can define a different biomarker, and we can image different biomarker linked to different aspects. This would help us disentangle different diseases, the early onset of them, how they progress, how to treat them, if a medicine is treating it well or not. So if I want a biomarker for neural atrophy, I should measure something which is neuron specific and so on for, uh, for instance, astrocytes or myelin or uh, oligodendrocytes. So as we know, MRI and diffusion MRI can kind of uh, uh, fill the gap in the resolution using the diffusion of molecules. I can go below the nominal resolution of the images just because the diffusion path of the molecules is micrometer length. So I can probe the tissue with diffusion MRI at high resolution produce images, but it's not specific. So I don't have water only in neurons. I don't have water only in astrocytes. I have everywhere. Um, to overcome this, in, uh, I was interested in metabolite diffusion because metabolites, on the other end, they can be more specific of the cells. First of all, they are only intracellular. Secondly, uh, as we will see uh, later on, uh, some of them are only neurons, some of them are only in, astrosa, in uh, glia. And, uh, uh, but the, the, the downside is that the resolution of uh, spectroscopy is not like the 
MRI. So you don't get images, you get voxels of quite big volume from which you recover the spectrum. So the idea is to join the two. I can gain specificity from uh, spectroscopy and can gain resolution from MRI. And what I will show you in this talk is uh, the first steps towards joining these two techniques. So as I said, the problem is that water is everywhere in the tissue, is in the intra-extracellular, is in different cells, but also it exchanged between these two compartments, probably. So in our experimental conditions, we wouldn't have water always inside the cells. So if the tissue changes due to a pathology, a lot is going on uh, from the water standpoint of view. All right? So that's an example, as I said, in Alzheimer. So if I measure simply the AEDC of water, and uh, one cell is becoming smaller, so I expect the ADC to, be, to go down because it is more restricted in a little environment. In other cell population, astrocytes is becoming bigger. If I measure the ADC of the water, I don't see any changes until one of the two processes dominates the other. Neuronal loss, for instance, they are completely dead. But this means waiting time uh, on the progression of the disease. If I, uh, with spectroscopy, I have access to a lot of other molecules. In particular, some of them like the NAA and uh, is a purely neuronal marker. It's mostly found in neurons. And other molecules like uh, choline and inositol, which are this peak here and this group of peak under here, they are uh, mostly found in glia. So if I can sensitize my spectroscopy experiment to diffusion, I can measure the diffusion of NAA, I can measure the diffusion of inositol, and they will be more direct marker of what's going on in neurons and in glia. Um, so here is, an, uh, um, is an, basically the compartmentalization of these metabolites. So it's not true that NAA is all in neurons and the inositol is all in glia. You have these metabolites spread across the cell types, but some of them are predominantly neurons, some of them predominantly in glia. So inositol and choline are six uh, times, three times higher in glia than in neurons, and the NAA and glutamate are mostly in neurons. So keep this in mind that anyway, I'm not saying all the inositol is in glia and all the NAA is in neurons. Um, and I can access very, uh, a wide range of properties of the cells using metabolites. It's the cellular morphology, which is what I will show you soon. Cytosol viscosity, which I've been uh, doing as well. I'm not showing this in this uh, presentation. If you use oscillating gradients, you can measure the diffusion a very short diffusion time. And this should give you an information of the viscosity because you try to measure the pure bulk diffusivity of these molecules, which is linked to the viscosity of the intracellular space. And so if you have accumulation of protein inside the cells, the viscosity should go up and you should be able to, uh, should increase and you should be able to measure it. Tortuosity of the cytosol and then changes in the, in the intracellular structure. So again, now, if I use NAA and I use choline or inositol, I'm able to disentangle these two phenomena occurring in the brain, and I may be able to define the early onset of this disease. Something that we have shown uh, other groups, and, and when I was in Paris, we have shown is that these molecules are metabolites, which means they are involved in the metabolism of the cell. So it's not obvious at all that they are freely to, uh, free to diffuse inside the cells. However, we and other groups performed many experiments showing that this is the case. They are not restricted, the majority of them are not restricted inside the, and the nucleus or, uh, cell, or uh, organelles. And uh, uh, the time of the interaction in, that involves those molecules in the metabolism is way faster than the diffusion time. So uh, on average, they are free to diffuse along the cells and they can be used as a probe of the cell structure. So exactly like we do with water, I can perform experiments at short diffusion time to measure the cytosol, uh, like for instance with oscillating gradients, 
I can do experiments at the intermediate diffusion time to try to measure the short range uh, feature of the morphology or long diffusion time to measure the long range feature of the morphology. Uh, for instance, the branching, uh, the branched structure of the cells. And uh, the, when you have access to a molecule which could potentially give you information on the morphology of the cells, a problem arise, arises. And the problem is that in MRI especially, we use very simple geometries to characterize a complex tissue like this one. So although in some, in many cases, a uh, bundle of cylinders crossing or dispersed can kind of capture the essential feature of the tissue, if you have a, a, a probe molecule that can uh, um, investigate structure as complex as this cell, this oversimplified picture doesn't help. So we need a more complex model for the cell to be able to characterize this cell. Uh, so what I did is to implement a computational approach or a computational generative model to generate <coughs> realistic structure of cells and then use these simulations to try to infer the cell morphology from metabolite diffusion. So here, basically, we want to from the signal we measure at this scale, which takes into account a huge piece of tissue, try to extract the morphology of the cell population inside. So this is a, a inference problem that is highly complex to solve and biophysical modeling can help. But as I said, biophysical modeling uh, in the way we use it, uh, the, uh, for instance, in diffusion MRI, it's based on analytical models, which are based on simple representations, cylinders, spheres, ellipsoids, uh, sticks. Uh, and this may not be uh, enough to characterize this complexity. So we can move to computational models. And the idea here is given the real structure, try to come up with a, a computational model of the cell and then use numerical simulations as my biophysical model, and then fit this to our data to extract the morphology. Of course, we talk about a tissue, so we also need to take into account that this is not single cells, it's a distribution of cells, which some particular properties that are all together in the tissue. So the idea is develop a generative model for the single cells, and then use a computational approach based on the distributions of the morphology to simulate the signal and some machine learning to learn the mapping between these two. Um, so here I will quickly go through the computational model that I have implemented. Um, the idea is simple. Uh, I believe that all the cell types can be uh, they are very complex, but they must have essential features in common that are enough to characterize their morphology. And I identified the 12 features uh, that I will show some example. And these 12 features are enough to characterize all the cell types in the brain, according that I know which are these values. So I can learn these values from histology, and then I can show you that I I can generate thousands of Purkinje cells that all are different from each other, but they all respect some statistics on these 12 features. Uh, this comes from uh, um, yeah, uh, some previous work I've been doing, plus some work that is done in the neuroscience. And then we use uh, Monte Carlo simulation in this structure to, do, to learn the mapping. So here is an example. One of the features is the branching. So of course, cells can be simple. So one branch, one fiber of the cell can have just a branching, but then I can regulate this, including more and more branching. So another feature is, for instance, the soma. So the soma can be bigger and bigger. Another feature can be, I don't know, the, the radius. You have variability in the radius. Then some of them may have spines, so I can include spines and so on. Curvature of the fiber and so on. So the idea is now, 
I have uh, access to Neuromorpho. I have access to uh, the Allen Institute database. I go there, I look at the structure of these cells, and I try to map that structure in my 12 feature parameter, uh, 12 parameter space. And what I get is that if I want to, to parameterize a Parkinji cell, that's the kind of structure I get, and these are the kind of 12 features I need uh, to, to encode uh, this morphology in this 12 uh, fold space. And then I can play because I can make this cell more and more spiny or I can change, I can prune, I can cut some link and so on. Um, we need to validate this. So what I did is exactly that. On the right, you can see there is uh, the real cells from Neuromorph. On the left, the one after having learned the, these 12 features from the histology, they look very similar. Uh, then uh, we can look at specific cells and look at, for instance, their morphogram. So how much, how many times they branch and so on. The two cells will never be equal because there is randomness in the process in the nature, but they share exactly the same uh, overarching complexity. If you go and you go measuring uh, uh, population uh, uh, average value of specific features like the branch length, uh, the branching order, and so on, you see they basically overlap. And what are we interested in is the signal, the MRI signal. They also are completely identical, either the signal as a function of p-value and the ADC. So this structure uh, are actually a good uh, representation, computational model of the real cells. And this means I can start now using this to explore different aspects of my experiments. So if I do signal as a function of p-value, you can see that Parkinji cell has this kind of behavior at different diffusion time, and this kind of ADC time dependence. Okay, if I move to a motor neuron, it's kind of different. So the Parkinji cell and the motor neuron has a different signal, a different time dependence. And if I go to a pyramidal, it's quite similar to a motor neuron. Just the ADC change a little bit. So this suggests that some of the morphologies have a huge impact on the signal. Some other are kind of more or less the same. So the idea is now I have a flexible tool to investigate which features actually count. Uh, so as a first application, uh, I was interested in uh, measuring the morphology of the cells. So here you can see the ADC time dependence for uh, different kind of cells. They have different morphologies. This is very compl complex with a lot of branching. This is quite simple. And this is uh, in the middle. And you can see that the ADC has a very different behavior as a function of time for uh, the three different kind of morphology. So I can measure if I have my metabolites, I can then measure the ADC as a function of time of my metabolites and try to link this time dependence with the morphology. Um, on the other side, if I'm not interested in the long range, I can use my simulation to see when I am sensitive to the sides of the, of the processes, for instance. And so if I perform experiments at low diffusion time and IB value, it turns out from the simulation that I should be very sensitive to the sides. So if I want the branching, I go at long diffusion time and low, low B value. If I want the sides, I go low diffusion time, high B value. I did these two kinds of experiments and I show you that actually we, we kind of guess pretty much well the morphology. So that's the first application. So the cells, either neuron or astrocyte, are modeled as uh, those complex structure, uh, branched structure. And uh, uh, for each cell, I have a population of cells. And the characteristics of this structure, such as the length of each segment of the number or the number of embranchment, so how many times it branches, will be a distribution to take into account that I'm measuring a voxel. So my computational model has the intrinsic diffusivity, taking into account of different viscosity at different sides of the molecule, the length of these branches, and the number of consecutive embranchment. 
This is the mean value, and then I have a distribution. So I have a standard deviation, for instance, around these values. Um, I start from an initial uh, value. I generate a tissue of thousands and thousands, thousands of these cells. I simulate diffusion in each, in each one of these. I compute the signal as a coarse grained average across uh, all these structures. I get my signal. And then I build a, a data set of these signals. And I use machine learning to learn the mapping between the unseen data, data and my distributions of values. In the end, I get basically the values that de define my distribution and my uh, diffusivity. That's the idea. We did that in two species, and uh, we did that in macaque and mouse. And here you can see how this is an average, uh, a picture to show the average uh, morphology of the cells that the computational model predicted. Uh, remember, I remind you that I, uh, astrocytes occupy 70% of the glia in the brain, and inositol and choline are mostly concentrated in the glia. So this structure here can be mostly associated to glia, to glia and astrocytes, and these mostly associated to neurons. Creatine is, uh, metabol uh, is highly involved in the metabolism, so it's switched continuously between the two compartments. And you can see how clearly uh, the structure here is intermediate between the big, large, and complex neuronal structure and the smaller uh, astrocytic structure. We see difference between uh, Astrocytes in macaque and in mouse, we don't see much difference between neurons and in macaque and in mouse. And this is completely compatible with uh, previous work uh, in histology where they found exactly a ratio more or less 2.5 bigger astrocytes in the macaque than in mouse. And if we take our estimates and we do the ratio, we find a pretty much 2.5. While for neurons, we find an average maximal extension of 500 micron and no difference between the two species. Again, very compatible with previous histological studies. So this, is, uh, this was really exciting, then, uh, but it's not a proper validation. I mean, okay, we found the right ratio. We found the right difference between the two species, but we would like to be more specific. So we did histology on, our, uh, on the actual brain and here is just a qualitative comparison between uh, the real histology, you see this is GFAP staining for astrocytes, and the virtual histology after I packed my cells in a virtual tissue and cut it with our virtual histology slice. And qualitatively, you can see they are very similar. Again, this is uh, qualitative. So then we focused on this and we isolated single cells in different slices, different cuts, and we compare the one-to-one, -one, the morphology of these cells. So we binarize them, we perform shoal analysis on them, and then we compute a statistics on a sample which was 450 or something like that. And these are just a subset of the metrics we evaluated, but they are one of the most relevant for neuroscientists. And you can see that there are no statistical difference between what we measure and what, they me what uh, the real histology is. Uh, we constantly, we consistently overestimate the sizes. So these are the branches, the complexity index. We, we, we perfectly match the values. The, in the length, we overestimate. Now, our estimates are in vivo, and these estimates are ex vivo. We use a model, and this is a direct uh, measure. It's a direct, uh, we, we image directly. So this overestimation is a mix of maybe shrinkage in the ex vivo uh, procedure and approximation of our modeling. So, but nevertheless, uh, the values are pretty much consistent. Okay. Jason, there's a part where you can image before you cut. No, we didn't. We just tried uh, uh, the conventional one. Um, and also, I, I really believe there is shrinkage, if I have to be honest, because the acquisition takes a lot of time. And so the, 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 to acquire these images in 3D micro, confocal microscopy takes took a few hours. So the sample undergo, underwent some uh, microstructural uh, rearrangement probably. Um, but as I will uh, show you also in next experiments we did in disease, uh, 
again, we overestimate, but we, 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 we see the correct uh, difference. Uh, when it should increase, increase, when it should decrease, decrease. But you're suggesting that you're not actually overestimating, suggesting that histology is underestimating. I'm suggesting that it could be both. It could be that the model is overestimating and that there is also a contribution of histology underestimating. Uh, also, there is another point that the histology used GFAP, which is a big molecule. So probably the finest, we, we don't see the, the end of the processes. It stops a little bit earlier. So that's why also it may overestimate, uh, underestimate. Um, then we applied uh, to measure the sites. And in this case, the acquisition is different. We acquired at very high B value with short diffusion time. This is the kind of spectra you get at different B values. And then each peak is uh, each metabolite. And now here we can use simple models to estimate the sites because we don't need the complex model because at short diffusion time, the molecules cannot jump different branches. So I don't need the branching, I'm insensitive to that. What I'm sensitive only of is the sites. And this was uh, cross-checked with the simulations. And here are the raw data and the fit of the model. And these are the sites we estimate from uh, neuronal marker and from uh, astrocytic marker. The sites are around uh, 0.6, below 1 micron for neurons and over 1 micron for uh, astrocytes. And this is coherent not only with what we found in literature, then dendrites are quite thinner than the astrocyte processes that are a little bit bigger. But it's also compatible with other experiments done from other groups later on, like Shemesh using double diffusion encoding found the similar uh, very, very close values, and um, Lundel uh, uh, found very close values. So this wouldn't be, uh, okay, this is interesting, but what is even more interesting is, okay, can I use this to measure changes in some pathology? So first of all, uh, when you have um, injury inflammation or a neurodegeneration like in Alzheimer, you have astrocyte reactivity. And that's the kind of situation you would see. An astrocyte would enlarge his processes, would enlarge his cell body, would become more and more active. So we should be able to measure quantitatively these changes. What we did, we started with a model, the, a CNTF model, where uh, uh, we injected mice with uh, lengthy CNTF, and this induced a huge rea uh, astrocyte reactivity in the brain. So all the astrocytes in the brain react. While in the control group is a normal brain with normal astrocytes in normal sites. So what we expect is that in CNTF, we have uh, uh, enlargement, uh, of the structure. This is the signal, and the only signal between uh, control and uh, CNTF group that was significantly different is inositol. So as a first result, we show that uh, inositol can be sensitive marker of astrocytic reactivity. And these are uh, uh, also true for the ADC time dependence. So we did both. We did the high B value and the ADC time dependence. This is the kind of real astrocytes we reconstructed with 3D uh, microscope, confocal microscopy. Here you see an example in the control, and then this one are in the CNTF. They should look bigger, thicker, and a little bit longer. If we use our computational model to evaluate the sides, we measure this for the sizes, and you can see that the cell body of the, of the astrocytes, we correctly estimate the, the values with very good uh, um, precision. And also the fibers uh, match very well with the histology. We measure an increase around uh, 20, 30% in the cell body and uh, equivalent, we uh, an increase in the fiber sites. Again, we overestimate a little bit the sites. For when it comes to the <coughs> overall structure, we did the experiment at long diffusion time to see embranchment, to see the length, and we found that, uh, again, we overestimate the length, but we capture the trend, the increase in both. Uh, from histology, six, 67, 70% of increase, we measure 100% of increase. 
And interestingly, we measure a non-significant decrease of the branching. So when, mm, these are pretty much. How do you deal with the distributions? In other words, uh, it's not as if all the astrocytes are uh, drawing a yeah. distribution of sizes. Exactly. So is that just the average estimate? Uh, so in other words, that the ones that are uh, apparently larger. Yeah, that, that's a very good point. For when it comes to the, to the, to the overall structure, this is true. We, we, may, we may weight the tail of the, long, of the biggest structure more than the, than the smallest structure. It's definitely true for the sides in the soma and the, and the sides of the fiber. This is known that what we measure is the higher moment of the distribution. So yes, we, we also uh, weight more the bigger structure when we measure it with this modeling. Uh, but what is interesting, uh, we found interesting, was that we capture the correct, well, the increase, the increase. The amount of their increase is more or less co coherent. And when we, they don't increase, they decrease, and it's not statistically significant, we found that. But this model, um, so we just visually, that's what we measure and that's what uh, the real one are, uh, including all the sizes that we measure and everything. So the problem is that this one is a, is a huge model where all the astrocytes react. In Alzheimer's disease, you don't all, in uh, some neurodegeneration, you may not have all the population reacting, you may have uh, less cells reacting. So uh, we, we tried another model, which is a model of uh, uh, tau pathology, uh, uh, 3XTG APPPS1 mice. And uh, uh, in this case, we expect re uh, astrocytic reactivity, but in a lower, uh, less than uh, in the CNTF. And uh, uh, yeah, we did a similar experiment. These are the spectra, and these are what we measured in, uh, in um, uh, DW uh, spectroscopy, we measured an uh, uh, increase of inositol, as in the previous one, and uh, a decrease in NAA. So this suggests neuronal atrophy, and an increase in inositol suggests uh, reactivity of the astrocyte. Then there are other markers of uh, metabolism that can be taken into account, like lactate, for instance. But uh, um, when it comes to the signal, Again, we can measure the sites, and if we look at inositol, in this case also uh, creatine was significantly different. But if we look at inositol, we measure again an increase in the sites, and in this case, the population affected by activity was much much lower than in the CNTF. So this suggests that we should have enough sensitivity to measure this kind of uh, activation. In, uh, um, in, in, in condition closer to the pathology. Um, and now we talk about uh, the SOMA. So now we switch from uh, diffusion MRS, where uh, uh, I show you some application for the overall structure and the sides and so on, to how we can uh, apply this computational model to measure uh, cell body with MRI. So the idea is that uh, so far, even though everybody, at least in diffusion MRI, everybody knows that this, the typical structure of the cells is like this, we kind of assumed that the signal coming from the intracellular space is mostly due to the neurites, so dendrites, for instance, and uh, that the soma and the contribution of the signal from the soma was equivalent to the extra neurite space. So we just uh, model it like the water in the extracellular space. And the typical model uh, used in uh, white matter and gray matter was this one, randomly oriented stick. Now you, you can have in gray matter dispersion of the fibers, and so you can use NOD or whatever other model you want to measure the orientation distribution or the orientation dispersion. And in white matter you can have more coherent uh, fibers, so no dispersion, and uh, if you want to measure the sites. Uh, 
what we showed with our uh, simulation is that if I take this uh, structure, which has new rights connected to the soma, and so the water can travel along the new rights, exchange with the soma, and then go in another new rights. Uh, this has a completely different signal at IB value than the picture used so far, just randomly oriented stick. So with simulation, we checked when I can neglect uh, branching, I can neglect curvature, I can neglect this kind of secondary fine uh, features. And I can assume uh, this complex structure can be equal to this one if I am at short enough diffusion time. Short enough diffusion time, molecules cannot see the curvature, cannot see the branching much. What they can see is just the exchange with the soma. But then there is another point. Can I use a, a simpler model to characterize this structure? So in other terms, can I say that the signal coming from the neurites and the signal coming from the soma are two different, are two signals coming from two non-exchanging compartments? This is a priori is not obvious to me that it could be the case. So can I model this as just sticks plus sphere? And so we use the simulation to show when in which time regime I can uh, use this model as a good approximation of the reality. Um, so the model that we proposed uh, for uh, gray matter, but in general for the whole brain, because you may have cell bodies also in mind matter, is the conventional one, randomly oriented sticks, extracellular space, but with an extra restriction in sphere compartment, which has specific sides. So it has a B dependence. It's not a dot. It has some B dependence, it has some sides, and they don't exchange between them. So while the non-exchange between intra and extracellular space, if you stay at long enough diffusion time, is kind of, uh, we all agree in the community, 10 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds is negligible, the exchange in extra. The exchange between new right and soma, we don't know when it can be negligible. So we use the simulation in this to, to, to validate, to identify this regime. When we can identify this regime, then by model construction, we can associate the model parameter to some microstructure feature. So by construction, the, these spheres should belong to the, so should correlate with the soma, so soma density and soma sides. And instead, the randomly oriented the cylinders or sticks should correlate with neurite in general. And uh, uh, some of them are also myelinated, so it should correlate with the mild architecture. And the extracellular space, okay, we, we discuss it in the extracellular. So to check if, uh, when we can use this model, we compute the ADC in this case, and we compute the ADC with this model. Uh, and, then, and then using Monte Carlo simulation in this case, and using analytical model in this case, and we compare the, the difference between these two ADC. This is kind of a metric of error that you, that you perform when you approximate this connected system with two non in non-connected system. And from the simulation, uh, we found that if we have diffusion time below 20 milliseconds, we can, uh, we, do, we do pretty good accuracy, use the simple model to characterize the more complex uh, uh, situation. Here you see different sizes. For, for example, this is a, an example of a large neuron, 1,000 uh, micrometer in diameter from here to here, and then you have different densities and different sides of the soma. For large neurons, it kind of work well. We, we make an error below 10% always at any diffusion time. And this is because basically, if the structure is very big, what is in the, in the, in the neurites stays mostly in the neurites, and what is in the soma stays there. So there is kind of a very particular condition where your model will fairly behave well. But if you consider a smaller neuron and in particular glia and microglia, then here your error is much bigger. And if you want to use the same model for all the cell population, it's safer to stay at low diffusion time where your error is, is below 10%. So this is an example. If I stay at 10, 10 milliseconds, 
the dashed black line is the simplified model. The continuous line is the connected model. You see that it, they overlap very well in any condition, except maybe in this one, where the, you have a tiny uh, difference between the theory and, uh, and the correct model. This difference is anyway negligible if you would have some noise. But if you move uh, higher, you move at 80 milliseconds, definitely for the small cells, you start making uh, much, much more error. So the model, uh, to, to use this simple model, uh, we need to be in a specific regime. I found, <laughs> then accidentally, I found a line your data set where uh, the conditions were exactly the one uh, I needed. So short diffusion time and very high p-value. This was up to 10,000. Uh, I used the direction average of the signal. So these, not, these many directions were useful to have a very high SNR. Uh, after some preprocessing, I fit my model, and these are the kind of maps I get. Where uh, here you can see the maps in uh, should correlate with new right density, and these are the maps that should correlate with soma density. Then uh, I can also measure other properties intra new right diffusivity or extracellular diffusivity and uh, extracellular volume fraction and the size of these cell bodies. However, because the acquisition wasn't optimized for this, I wouldn't rely too much, for instance, on this map, because for having a reliable measure of this, we need to tweak a little bit the parameters, but we can do that. And uh, so these two, the volume fraction, should be reliable anyway. And uh, here you can see a comparison. Uh, between uh, uh, this sphere dense signal fraction, we should correlate with soma density and the initial staining from, uh, uh, from the brain map atlas I found online. I tried to, to, to take more or less the same slides. This one is not exactly the same, but you can see that the contrast overall uh, match very well. Um, and the same holds for uh, the new right density. Uh, where uh, the myelin should uh, correlate very much in white matter with uh, this new right density. Um, moreover, uh, what we can do, we can take these soma, this, uh, soma density maps in 25 subjects, average them, and then use free surfer to project onto the cortical surface uh, of the onto the cortical surface. And this is the average map we get, where you can see the, the colors and the contrast is signal fraction that should correlate with soma density. Here I also reported the, the Broadman um, uh, areas that are available on FreeSurfer, uh, which are only this one. But for this one that are available, the boundaries between the Broadman areas and the gradient in this uh, soma density match extremely well, in particular for the areas one, three, four, and six that are known to be very well uh, defined using cytoarchitectonic uh, features. Um, so how they are defined? They are defined according to the density and uh, also the organization. I, the resolution was 1.5 millimeters, so I cannot uh, see the organization of these layers, but I can see the density. So here you see, for instance, that coherently I go from low density to high density, how it has been defined in these two areas. Then again, I go very high density, high density. This area here is basically the one with highest density. And then I go down to lower density in the green area here. Area 45, 44, they are known to be uh, high density, low density, and quite difficult to separate between them. So if we take this into account, it's quite works pretty well. And then the areas uh, of the visual cortex, 17 and 18, are both high density. So this seems that uh, the contrast that we get makes sense and uh, can correlate pretty much with, uh, with the soma density, but it's not a one-to-one -one comparison. So uh, here is an example of uh, intersubject variability, 
where you have a bit of variability, but you still have a very much consistency across the Bronman areas. If you look at the right density, it's 17, 18, so you should see something there. New right density or, or uh, soma density? Correct. Right. No, I, uh, for the new right, uh, I have the data, I, <coughs> I didn't look at it. Because um, I was focused on trying to validate, the, but I will. So what, what shall I expect to see? 17, that's huge amounts of money. Okay, cool. Yeah, I can look at it uh, later. Uh, so to try to validate this, uh, we did some experiments ex vivo. Uh, so we use mouse, a uh, couple of mice, and we scanned with a very high B value, up to 40,000 spin echo, and uh, 10 milliseconds of diffusion time. And these are the maps I got uh, for three representative slides on soma density, where you can see the layering of the cortex, the hippocampus, olfactory bulbs, cerebellum. In this case, the sequence was also optimized for the sides, so you can measure the sides a little bit more reliably. And you see that, for instance, in the hippocampus, you can clearly see the arrangement of big soma, probably pyramidal cells that are arranged in this uh, subfield of the hippocampus. Small uh, granule cells are concentrated a lot in the cerebellum, which is the region where I measure the smallest sites. And then the olfactory bulb has a layering of small, big, small, big, which appear, appears evident even here. Then this is the fiber uh, density, uh, which should correlate again with myelin mostly. Uh, as for the human brain, we did us first a comparison with the uh, atlases, and you can see there is a very strong com correlation with nissel staining. And here is with myelin, so the maps looks, the contrast looks convincing. To be more quantitative, on the same brain, we did, uh, this is the MRI map, this is the DAPI staining, which is an adult staining for the cell body. And if I zoom on, on the MRI map and on the Nissel staining map, this is the kind of profile in the same mouse brain that we find. Uh, you can see the density changes across the layers of the cortex in uh, perfect agreement with then what we know and what we actually measured in this brain. And this is true also for the olfactory bulb, which uh, this is the histology, this is the MRI map, and this is the comparison where you can see in yellow the cell bodies arranged uh, in layers uh, with the higher density, lower density, lower density, and this match as well. Uh, these are uh, still uh, data in process. So at the moment, I can show you just for instance, in a random ROI here in the gray matter, there is a strong correlation between DAPI staining and the density that we measure in the sphere signal. And I can do this in different areas, and this is work in progress. But I think it's encouraging. So to finish, to conclude, uh, I first uh, uh, discussed about the potentiality of the diffusion MRS, which uh, I think it's a unique technique to access information of the single uh, uh, cell types. And we can use computational models to extract a lot of information out of this data. Uh, however, the experimental design is crucial. So we need to use a simulation framework to understand by controlled experiment in silico, which are the actual features that matters when we measure, when we acquire the data. And also the data analysis in this case is very challenging. It's not as you acquire the spectra and you do the integration under the peak dump. No, there is a lot of work to do to clean the, the data and to make the data reliable. Uh, so the translation to clinics of this kind of application is a little bit more challenging, but it is doable. Uh, Itamar Ronani has been doing a lot of this translation, and we are uh, collaborating actively with him, and uh, I believe uh, it can be done. You need the, the problem, you need strong gradients, because metabolites are five times, four times slower than water. So you need to reach 40,000, you need to reach 20,000, if you want the equivalent of 5,000, 10,000 for water. So uh, one problem. No, usually scan times are around 30 minutes, not for, uh, for all the application. If you want to do the size of the cells, 
IB value that can be kept uh, around 20, 30 minutes. The ADC time dependence, yes, that can take long. But you can do in different section and then uh, sessions and then uh, join the data. Even the data I show you are not acquired. Uh, the same mice, the same mouse didn't have uh, the acquisition all uh, the same day because it lasted over, it lasted for three hours uh, for, to collect two data points. So that one can be optimized in multiple sessions. But the IB value one can be done in a reasonable time, but you need a strong gradients and potentially higher field. Three Tesla for NAA is fine. In Usidol, you don't see a three Tesla. It's very, very, you cannot do diffusion with it. In Usidol, it's very challenging. But seven Tesla, high gradients would be <laughs> beautiful. By NAA, you can do a three Tesla. Uh, and then for MRI, we introduced uh, yeah, this new method for mapping uh, SOMA uh, using MRI and potentially quantify cyto and mail architecture and provide a set of new biomarker uh, of potential value. Of course, again, experimental design is crucial. So there is something we can tweak to get those results better. In particular, I'm interested in uh, using the simulation to identify the best wave shape, the best gradient shape, to disentangle so my new rights that not necessarily has to be a PGSC, it can be something else. And then the experimental validation is still a necessary step. Uh, so I would like to thank everybody, all the collaborators and the centers that allowed me to do all the experiments and the histology in particular. And thank you all for the attention.